really unrealistic, but we kind of give up a little bit of the integrity of the process with technology because there's no way Mitchell should ever have to approximate sine one ever in his life, right? Right? Really, you should never have to. Somebody go to their calculator for me, be in radian mode, and if you could tell me what sine one is, go ahead, Keith, read off a few. One more, just so I can fill the box. Whatever, I'm fine truncating. There we go. So that's the actual. Why in the world do I have to go approximate now? Because I want you to value the historical process. It's since gone away, but historically, that could never happen. And by historically, I don't mean thousands of years ago. I mean, I couldn't have done sign one, right? I didn't have a scientific calculator when I was in high school. We got to read them off of tables, but where did they come from off the tables and all that kind of stuff? So first of all, we're going to start this off. It says fifth degree McLaurin polynomial for sine x. So my sine x, right, I'm going to approximate with a fifth degree polynomial. Centered at what? Zero, because of the McLaurin. So I know I'm doing C equals zero. I know my X is going to eventually be one. But first, I'm just going to generate the polynomial. You should have it memorized. Sign is the one that starts at what? Do you remember? Because you got to have that one memorized. X, yeah, it's the odd function. Minus X cubed over 3 factorial plus X to the fifth over 5 factorial. There is my approximation, right? I am going to next, I think I already did this on a calculator, so we don't have to have Keith plug them all in. Um, I'm going to go do sine 1, and I'm going to approximate it with my Taylor polynomial. It's going to be about equal to 1 plus 1 sixth plus 1 over... 5 factorial is 120 last I checked, right? And we're going to keep the integrity of this intact and assume you don't have technology. And we're going to keep this as a fraction. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So I'm going to do a 120 over 120 minus 20 over 120 plus 1. So I'm going to keep this as if I'm living way back when. It looks like I have 101 over 120. And I'm going to leave that in a box, but I do want you to go give me that as a decimal just so we can kind of compare. So Keith, if you could 0.84166 what? And notice how close I actually already am to what Keith told me the actual was, but that's not my concern. It says to find the maximum error of my approximation. And this is where it gets a little weird, so listen up. The maximum error we call the remainder sub what? Five, right? And I'm going to be doing that for any x, but I'll put a 1 in in a second. I just want you to get used to the formula. Remember, now I go to the next term. I do it over 6 factorial. I do x minus c to the 6th power, and I'm going to maximize the 6th derivative at some unknown spot. And if I can find that spot exactly, then that's exactly my error. If I can overshoot it, I can approximate my error. So we're going to go plug this stuff in. First of all, what's x in this scenario? 1, right? What's c in this scenario? 0. So this is really going to be the, and sometimes that absolute value, they double do it in here. It doesn't matter because it happens either way. Um, but anyway, 1 to the 6th is just one. So this is what I've got going. The thing is, is what is that? And I'm going to show you on a graph. And it does help to do a little uh, theory here. So take a look. My original function is sine, correct? Give me the first derivative. Hurry up. Cosine, second, third, fourth, fifth. Sixth, there it is. There's the sixth derivative, right? Watch on a graph. You're trying to maximize the absolute value of the sixth derivative, right? And I'm going to put it up here. Negative sign, and again, I'm going to be graphing the derivative, so you can, uh, actually the sixth derivative, sorry. I'm going to be graphing negative sign, so it's going to go like this and like this and like this. Right here is what? What's that? 
the little red tick, where is that? That's pi over two. It's a little past, about one and a half. So I'm looking at one, what the maximum absolute value of that is. Well, right here, that would be the point one comma negative sign one, correct? So that's it. What's the problem with my reasoning by just saying, oh, I'm just gonna put a sign one in here. It's what I'm trying to find. So historically, they couldn't do that. We can now. Like if I wanted the exact error, I'd put a sign one in here. But they had to overshoot it. They had to pick something they knew for sure that was really close. What value do you know for sure? What y value do you know on this curve for sure that overshoots it? What is sine and cosine always bound by? One. So what they would use is a one. And when you're doing your homework in the ones with sines and cosines, you're not going to worry about, again, I'd have, like he said, cyclical reasoning in there if I go use sine one in my approximation to find sine one. See what my problem is? So historically, they couldn't do what we could do. So they'd move over to one, and they would do this. And then I have to do less than or equal to, because I'm, I'm overshooting it, and I'm finding a safe upper bound. By the way, you should have known this was going to pop out anyway, based on the series I'm, or the polynomial I'm working with. Why? What kind of a polynomial is that? It's an alternating, yeah. And we've already said that if it alternates, you can use the first unused term. So this would have been minus one over six factorial absolute value. Do you see how it matches? So this one, if this were like on the AP exam, if they're alternating, use the alternating. Just go to the next term, take the absolute value. But this is the Lagrange process for it. Could you go and divide that for me? I don't think I did it. Okay, so 0 0.00138, this is called the what? Just so you're, you're clear as to what you just found. What's that 0 0.00138 repeated called? My maximum error, they call it a Lagrange error bound or the maximum amount of the remainder. Now when it says to find an interval in which you know sine one must lie, how do I get that interval? What would I do right here? I take my approximation right here, right? And I would, by the way, if I didn't have a calculator though, it, to keep it historically accurate, my approximation was this, right? 100, 120th. I would go down one over six factorial and then I would do long division and do that. And to be historically accurate, I didn't have a calculator and all that would have had to been long divided. Uh, however, we now can just use our decimals. So I could do point, uh, my approximation was 0.842, again right here, and then I'd go up 0 0.001, and then I'd do it down. And again, I'm rounding to three because that's what College Board usually requires, and so I'm truncating that right there. And you would have a reasonable window. Does this actual one fall in that window? Because when we started, I had Keith do sine one. Is it in my window? Oops, I should have gone down. Sorry, down and then up. It will be in my window if I hadn't rounded so much. Um, then last one says, could it equal 0.9? No, why not? It's not in the interval. All right, last one I think that I'll do today. So this one's e to the x. And again, it's getting that upper bound for the z that's going to bug you. So we're going to keep this accurate. It says fourth degree McLaurin. So I'm centered at zero. And it says to approximate e, e is really e to the first. So my x is going to be at one. So we're going to start this off. We're going to create our polynomial. It's going to be called p sub four of x, right? And you should have this one memorized, Holmes. Do you have the E to memorized? Yep. Thank you. One more. X to the fourth over four factorial. And I don't put dot, dot, dot. 
because this is my uh, polynomial I'm going to use to approximate e. I'm going to approximate e to the first using this polynomial. So the next thing I go do is I go get e to the first. It's going to be approximately 1 plus 1 plus 1 half, right, plus 1 sixth plus 1 24th. If I were going to keep the historical accuracy right now, what would I really do? I'd get it all as a fraction. So I'm going to go do that. Okay, I'm going to keep it historically sound. I'm pretending I don't have a calculator because if I had one, I'd just go hit my E button, right? So there's a little bit of disconnect between technology and the history of it, but the history of it's it's kind of cool. Um, so that would be 24 plus 24 plus 12 halves plus 4 sixths plus 1. Can someone add that up? 48 65. Thank you, 24. So that's going to be 65, 24. That is my approximation for E. And just for shits and giggles, if you could, Keith, go divide 65 by 24. And that would be called my polynomial approximation for E using a fourth degree polynomial. It'll be close. It's going to be quite a bit off because I didn't go very far, but 2.7 ish, I bet. 0.8. Three repeated. All right, so there's my approximation. It says, find a Lagrange error bound. See how it says A error bound? Because really, we're going to find the best one. Here's what I've got. My error, which we're going to call R sub what? Four, right? At x, we'll just keep it real here, is going to be equal to, I go to the next term, I'm going to do a 5 factorial, I'm going to do x minus c, but what's c in this one? 0, so I'm going to have x to the 5th, I'm going to have the 5th derivative at some unknown spot that maximizes the derivative, boom. But I'm not going to find that exact spot. I'm going to overshoot it a little bit. So here I go, what is my x that I'm going to be using? What am I finding? 1. So let's go replace that with that. So it's going to be the absolute value of the f maximum the fifth derivative could ever be over 5 factorial. Now this one's pretty easy. Because the function was e to the x, what's the fifth derivative? e to the x. <laughs> so when I'm looking at the fifth derivative, f5 of x, and I'm looking at its graph, right? And I'm really looking at it centered right here, and I'm looking kind of up this way, right? The maximum that could be is right here. How high did that get? What's the maximum that value can be? Again, f of are y values. How high did this get? Some e. But I can't use an e. You know what I mean? Historically, they couldn't put an E in there because that's what they were trying to find. So they went and they overshot it. What Y value is really nice that's super close to E? 3. There it is. Instead of going up to E, we're just going to overshoot it a little bit, and historically, they'd use a 3. Does that make sense? Right? Actually, the, the Y value would be 3. So I'm going to overshoot that with a 3. If I put an E there, it'd give me the exact error. But again, to keep this accurate historically, there's a problem I got off a of college board. One of the multiple choice ones on your test, they have both answers sitting there, which is bad because if you put E over 5 factorial and it's calculator active, that's the best answer, right? But 3 over 5 factorial is realistic for the integrity of the problem, so I accept both of them. <laughs> so when, if you get into that, um, anyway, can someone divide that for me? What do you get? Uh, point zero what? Two, five, what else? Oh, perfect. All right. So now it says, give me an interval that E must lie in. Historically, how did we figure out, you know, if we wanted to be within a thousandth or whatever, here's my interval. I would be my approximation. But again, if I was going to keep the integrity of history here, I'd use the fraction I would go down 3 over 5 factorial, and then I would go up 3 over 5 factorial. And if this was a non-calculator question, you'd be done. These are usually calculator active, though, and they're usually not functions you know. They usually are like that first kind where I gave you all the ingredients and you just plug it in. Um, 
but if you were to do the decimal versions of these, you would have it all set to go. I'm not going to do the decimal versions. Uh, I am going to do the last one so we can just be done. All right. So here's where you generally, how you generally see them on College Board. So there's not any of that ambiguity of, okay, I have my calculator and I'm approximating something my calculator does, and that's bothering me because I live in the 21st century, not the 17th century, and so no need, right? I can do e to the fourth, bam. So what they'll do is they'll give you all the ingredients for a fake function, and they'll have you work with that. So take a look. It says, the function f has derivatives of all orders. What does that mean? You can derive it forever and ever and out to infinity, like e and sine and all those ones that are always kind of over and over and over again. It's not a polynomial itself that's going to eventually go to zero. And they give you f of 2. So without even looking at this, what's the center? 2. Yep, you know we're going to be centered at 2 before they even tell me because they're giving me f of c, f prime of c, f double prime of c, f triple prime. You guys go ahead and write that. Write the Taylor polynomial for f about 2 and then use it to approximate f of 2.3. So you should have two things written, a generic polynomial with x's in it and then go replace it. This is how College Board likes to do it so that we're not goofing up about the actual function f. It's arbitrary. It's generic. You just need to know the models. Oh, I hate writing out these Taylor polynomials. Ah! There, did I goof up anywhere? I've got my third degree Taylor polynomial, my f of c plus f prime of c times x minus 2 to the first, f double prime, I'm all good to go. I am now going to use it to approximate f of 2.3. And again, this is an approximation. It's a finite polynomial that's a little bit off. Um, I need to now go replace my x's with 2.3's and these ingredients with what they handed me. So I'm going to be doing 6, f of 2, plus f prime of 2, 4, right, times what? Uh, 0.3, yep, it's 2.3 minus 2, so all these are going to be 0.3's. And then f double prime was a minus 7, right? So that would be 0.3 squared over 2 factorial. And then my third they handed me all these ingredients because they don't want you. Right. Uh, what am I? Over three factorial. Could you leave it like that or do you think you have to clean up your coefficients? Like, do you think you need to make this eight six and then four thirds or can you leave it? You can leave it for an FRQ. If it's multiple choice, they'll probably clean it up. Okay, so you would go, I'll tell you what you get on that with your calculator. I did it already. I was trying to avoid the whole calculator issue. I think I did it. I got 7.191. Does that back, any, anyone enter it yet? Keith, did you do it yet? 7.191. I'm going to put it on there and hope that's right. I, somebody should back me on that, though. I'm the worst calculator user in the room. I don't use mine much, Aaron. All right, so next up, it says... The fourth derivative satisfies this. Why are they telling you that? Anticipate. Why did they just give you that info? Yeah, the remainder. And they're, just, they're giving you the upper bound. They're handing you that f um, to the fourth prime at z. They're saying, well, I don't, you don't know it exactly, but we do know that it never goes over 9. So it says use the Lagrange error bound. So here I go. My error is going to be called r sub what? 3. It's going to equal, and it's going to have a 4 factorial. It's going to have an x minus c to the fourth. So what am I going to put right here? 
Point three, yeah, because we're doing uh, 2.3. So point three to the fourth. This right here, the absolute value of what I put in here is what maximizes the fourth derivative. What am I going to put in there? A nine. But then I'm going to change that to a less than or equal to because I'm overshooting it. These are redundant, but they're there. So all you'd have to do is 9 times 3 to the point 0.3 to the 4th over 4 factorial. And I will tell you, you get 0 0.003. And this is called the maximum error or the remainder. It is the most off that that is. So then it says, based on the above information, I think this is an old FRQ. It feels like it is. I must have screenshot this out of... Who knows what year? But anyway, it says, could f of 2.3 equal 6.992? Well, your interval of confidence is going to be 7.191 down my maximum error, comma, 7.191 up my maximum error. And I have no, can somebody do that arithmetic for me? It's not going to fall in there, is it? No. So we would, right? It's not going to make it. So we'd say no, f of 2.3 is not an element of my interval of confidence. What do you think? Can you do that? Well, that wasn't so bad, was it? Um, I am going to pause.